What's the probability of generating the building blocks for life from non-life? The probability of evolution, this week on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Now this week, we're going to be looking at the probabilities of trying to get anything that could be called life from non-living chemicals. That's right. our subject. A couple of years ago, we did an episode, uh, season three, uh, episode 14, that dealt with chemical evolution, life from non-life or abiogenesis. People sometimes right. say that this is uh, not really a part of evolution, but that's nonsense, of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, if you're going to propose that all life on Earth goes back to a single cell and you can't explain how the cell got there, then evolution's dead before it even gets going, right? Right. So, yep. so the probability of first life, chemical evolution, as it's called, uh, as you'll see, is a massive problem for evolution. Right. They, they try to skirt around this, but it's like if you're traveling from Chicago to Atlanta, pretending that the, the only directions that you really need are the last few hundred feet of the trip. <laughs> that, that's, you got a lot, lot more to get there. Right, so. right. Well, let's, let's start with a key historical event uh, to set the stage for this week's topic. On the 30th of June in 1860, it was an event which, in the minds of many people, was the turning point for the public acceptance of the theory of evolution and its confrontation with Christianity. And this event was the debate between the agnostic Thomas Huxley, who came to be known as Darwin's bulldog, right. and yeah. the uh, Anglican Bishop of Oxford, Samuel Wilberforce, son of the famous anti-slavery politician, William Wilberforce. Yeah. Uh, the debate was held at a, a meeting of the British Association in Oxford, at which Bishop Wilberforce was vice president and was sparked by the publication of Charles Darwin's Origin of Species seven months earlier in November of 1859. Okay, Wilberforce was an experienced and skillful debater, as well as being a theologian. He was an able naturalist, a fellow of the Royal Society, and had the unusual combination of being both professor of theology and professor of mathematics at the University of Oxford. Uh, he was well versed in Darwin's theory, and shortly before the debate took place, he had written a 19,000 word review of Darwin's origin, which was published in the July 1860 Quarterly Review. When Darwin read this review, his comment was, it's uncommonly clever. It picks out with skill all the most conjectural parts and brings forward well all of the difficulties. Right. So. <laughs> now Wilberforce began the debate and, after making several scientific points, concluded with Paley's argument that a watch implies the existence of a watchmaker. And similarly, Design found in nature implies the existence of a designer. Sure, yeah. Huxley then arose and is said to have put forward his now well-known argument that six eternal monkeys, uh, or apes, typing on six eternal typewriters with unlimited amounts of, uh, of paper and ink and so on, uh, given enough time, could produce a, a psalm, a Shakespearean sonnet, even the whole, uh, the whole book, purely by chance, that, that by, by random striking of keys, they could produce things like that. Right, that of course, uh, the, you'd have to have six eternal monkeys. Why, where'd the mon eternal monkeys come from? And even those have brains well, but, to a certain <laughs> degree. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> in his presentation, Huxley pretended to find the, uh, the 23rd Psalm among the uh, reams of written gibberish produced by his six imaginary apes at their typewriters. Right, right, yeah. uh, but he went on to make uh, his point that in, in the same way, molecular movement, given enough time and matter, could produce Bishop Wilberforce himself, <laughs> purely by chance and without the work of any designer or creator, which is like many creationists have often said, if you, you, know, if you take uh, hydrogen gas and you leave it alone long enough, it can turn into people with brains that can actually talk about this kind well, of stuff. Well, yes, of course. Uh, that's <laughs> what we're told. <laughs> right. um, so, is Huxley right? <laughs> I mean, you, you, you still hear people trying to use this argument today. Absolutely. That chance is a better explanation for origins than design. Right. We'll examine that when we get back. 
Did you know that the DNA code is itself governed by another code known as the epigenetic code? This physical and chemical code determines which genes are switched on. Changes in this code can greatly alter an organism without altering one letter of its DNA. For instance, scientists have managed to change the coat colour in mice by feeding them a diet that switches off certain genes. Epigenetics poses new problems for evolution. For instance, a group of animals with a camouflaged coat colour might be favoured in a particular environment. But if this coat colour is due to epigenetics and not the actual DNA code, then the non-camouflaged animals would be selected against in vain. When the epigenetic modification is reset by a diet change, natural selection is sent back to square one. The field of epigenetics therefore creates problems for evolution and strongly points to a master programmer who invented the DNA and epigenetic codes. To find out more from Creation Ministry International, visit our website creation.com. If you just tuned in this week, we're talking about the probability of evolution. Is chance a better explanation for origins than design? That's that's the topic. So let's get back to Huxley's uh, typing <laughs> apes analogy. Just kind of silly. Let, let's, <laughs> oh, well, let's just play it through. Uh, let, let's imagine a special typewriter with, with user friendly keys to apes. Yeah. With, with 50 keys comp comprised of, of 26 capital letters, 10 numbers, one space bar, and 13 symbols for uh, pronunciation, uh, pun punctuation, etc. Uh, how long would it take uh, an average operator, the, the apes here, to correctly type the 23rd Psalm by randomly striking keys on the typewriter? To obtain the answer, let's first consider uh, the first verse of Psalm 23, which reads, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Very famous, you all, you all know this, I'm sure. Okay, well, according to the multiplication rule of probability in simplified form, the chance of correctly typing the three designated letters of the from the possibilities is one in 50 times 50 times 50, which equals 125,000. At a rate of one strike per second, the average time taken to make 125,000 strikes is 34.72 hours. Okay, so there we have it. The, the <laughs> chance of randomly typing the eight keys, seven letters, and one space in, in the right sequence for the two words, the Lord, is then, if we just work it out, one in 50 times 58 times. That's 50 to the eighth power. So that's one chance in 39 billion, 62 million. Now, there are 31,536,000 seconds in a year. So at the rate of one strike per second, that would be 1,238,663.7 years. To Seems get to be getting a little trickier two as words, we go along here. Yeah. To the Lord. <laughs> so the time taken on average to correctly type the whole of verse 1 in, in the 23rd Psalm, which contains 42 letters, punctuation, spaces, would be 50 to the 42nd power right. divided by the number of seconds in a year, which is 7.2 times 10 to the 63rd years. Yeah. That's Unbelievable. A, that's a lot of years. Yeah. And the time taken on average to correctly type the whole 23rd Psalm, and this was, uh, this was Huxley's argument, remember, yeah made up of 603 letters, verse, numbers, punctuation, and spaces would be 50 to the 603rd power. That gives us 9.552 times 10 to the 1016th power years. <laughs> Incredible. So if the letter B stands for billion, this could be written like this. Uh, but for the evolutionist age of the Earth, uh, um, is only 4.6 billion years, and the yeah. evolutionist age of the universe is only around 13 uh, billion years, right? So it, it, it doesn't work at all. No. Uh, just, ironically, at the debate, Wilberforce didn't have an answer to, to Huxley's statement uh, the 23rd, that, that, that Psalm 23 could be typed out by monkeys. <laughs> Since the Earth and universe are not infinitely old, uh, if he would have done the math, just, just like we did, Huxley's argument would have been exposed as ridiculous. It just doesn't work. The, so. the details of what we've, what we've discussed here were from an argu uh, article in Creation Magazine titled, Could Monkeys Type the 23rd Psalm? <laughs> and uh, that article's uh, available online at creation.com slash monkeys. We did that exercise just to give you a glimpse of the huge improbabilities of, uh, of only 603 characters coming together yes. by chance. Yeah. But we uh, apply probability theory to the correct arrangement of, of a DNA molecule, uh, 
Well, it just doesn't work, right? It just doesn't work. No. And even evolutionists have stated that. In, in his book, Nature and the Origin of the Biological World, E.J. Ambrose writes, uh, he says, when we come to examine the simplest known organism capable of independent existence, the situation becomes even more fantastic. In the DNA chain of the chromosome of the bacterium E. coli, a favorite organism used by, micro, by molecular biologists, the DNA helix consists of three to four million base pairs. These are all arranged in a sequence that is meaningful in the sense that it gives rise to enzyme, uh, enzyme molecules which fit the various metabolites and products used by the cell. This unique sequence represents a choice of one out of 10 to the two millionth power alternative ways of arranging bases. We are compelled to conclude that the origin of the first life was a unique event which cannot be discussed in terms of probability. Well, then that's called a miracle then. He's given up. Oh, if it yeah. can't be discussed exactly. in terms of a probability, then it's a miracle. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, here's an evolutionist who recognizes it's, it's impossible, yet he, you know, he believes it happened somehow, and he's got some, you know, a lot of faith, for example. And, I mean, even when you're talking about these, yeah. uh, you know, these things being tapped out, if you want to put that in terms of DNA, letters coming together, uh, evolutionists say random mutations are what creates new information. So what's locking in the words, the Lord? It, what locks right. them there before they yeah. get switched up and changed? Yeah, it's much easier to believe uh, and more scientific to believe that there's a creator. And we'll explore some objections to this massive problem for evolution after a short break. For a more in-depth understanding of topics relating to the creation-evolution debate, the Journal of Creation contains peer-reviewed research papers that support the biblical account of creation, the flood, and the fall. One subscriber said, I always assumed that this journal would be too academic for me. Not so. I am a Christian with a very inquiring mind. With each issue, I find powerful articles that open doors and shine light on my understanding of the world. Each journal of creation is more than 120 pages and published three times a year. To subscribe, visit creation.com. All right, welcome back. This week we're talking about the probability of evolution, or, or the improbability of it, rather. <laughs> yeah, well, really the improbability of chemicals coming together by chance to produce anything close to resembling life. Right. So evolutionists, the, the, the honest ones anyways, recognize that this is a huge problem and, and have attempted to get around it, obviously. Let's look at some of their suggestions. Here are some things that they've suggested. Right. Well, some have said that you wouldn't need to line up, uh, you know, get all the chemicals lined up at the same time that it could be done bit by bit, of course. They, they suggest that natural selection might play a role. Okay, all right. But natural selection is all about reproduction. The organism that, re that produces the most offspring wins. Right. That's what it's all about. And at that stage, there's no reproduction. So, so that's out. Right. You need a living thing in order to have it. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. So Huxley's argument relies on an eternal universe with his eternal monkeys. Right. And some evolutionists are now postulating that the universe is eternal. Because if time's eternal, they argue, then theoretically, any event is certain to occur right. after a while. But the universe can't be eternal. <laughs> That's the problem. It's operating in accordance with the second law of thermodynamics and slowly approaching heat death. Heat death occurs when all the energy in the cosmos is degraded at, to, to random heat energy and random motions of molecules and uniform low temperatures everywhere. If the universe were eternal, this state would already have been reached. Right. So it's not infinitely old. Right. So another suggestion is the somewhere, sometime notion that because yes. we're all here, the origin of first life must have happened somewhere, sometime. Here's where evolutionists start talking about other universes before ours and, and then things like that, you know, the mul multiple universe scenario. Uh, scientists then point out that there's a, a fatal scientific weakness with that is it's not falsifiable. It's right. not How science. Would, yeah, <laughs> Professor A.M. Uh, Hasselfer a statistician from the University of New South Wales has, in regard to that, he said this, the fatal weakness of the monkey argument, which <laughs> calculates probabilities of, of events somewhere, sometime, is that all events, no matter how unlikely they are, have probability one, as long as they are logically possible, so that the suggested model can never be falsified. Accepting the validity of Huxley's reasoning puts the whole probability theory outside the realm of verifiable science. In particular, it vitiates the whole, pro the whole 
of quantum theory and statistical mechanics, including thermodynamics, and therefore destroys the foundations of all modern science. Okay, so, so, so that doesn't work either. That one doesn't work, <laughs> yeah. Um, there is one other aspect that needs to be considered. Uh, this is yet another fatal flaw in Huxley's reasoning and that, uh, uh, that of his modern day followers as well. Let's pretend that time is infinite and, and probabil probability equals one. Would Huxley's argument work? No. No. No, it wouldn't. The idea that life can form spontaneously from non-life involves the formation of proteins from peptides which formed from amino acids, which formed from gases in a reducing atmosphere. However, the biochemical reactions involved in the formation of amino acids and, and, and peptides and proteins and so on are reversible. You right. already hinted at this a few minutes ago. Exactly. They don't stay the same. Yeah. Right? In the simplest reaction of two amino acids forming a dipeptide, a water molecule is released. Under the right conditions, the dipeptide would react with a third amino acid to form a tripeptide and releasing another water molecule and so on. So the problem is water inhibits the kinds of reactions needed to build more complex amino acids and it favors the reverse reaction, the breaking down of a long chain of amino acids. But don't textbooks say that life on Earth began in the ocean, in a bunch of water? Oops. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Well, the purpose of Huxley's typewriter argument was to show that given enough time, any event is certain to occur. However, this is, uh, for this argument to be analogous to the idea of forma formation of uh, proteins by chance, uh, a chance combination of amino acid molecules, Huxley's typewriters need to be reversible. Right. So, so to make this analogy more accurate, when, it, when a key is depressed, a letter is typed, but when a key is released, the letter dis disappears. Right. So, so that, that makes a, a problem with trying to create anything that's actually going to fix and then have other things attach and other things attach and other right. things attach because all the time. things form and then they break apart and they form and they break apart. If, right. if, if it's going to approach reality at all, uh, the yeah, analogy the, the, There's complex work. molecular machinery keeping things together. Yes, and that's what we did on that program two years ago. Right. Uh, uh, but we'll be back with more in just a few minutes. Mud cracks, as they are commonly called, form when muddy sediment is exposed to the air and dries out. This causes the mud to dehydrate, shrink and crack. Some Bible critics claim that mud cracks disprove the global flood because they are supposedly found throughout the geological record and therefore imply a series of prolonged periods of drying out instead of one great watery cataclysm that laid down most sedimentary layers. However, this argument is far from rock solid because true mud cracks are easy to confuse with cracks formed by other mechanisms that don't involve a period of drying out. For instance, it is well known that structures resembling mud cracks can form underwater. Moreover, research suggests that true mud cracks could develop within hours. So flood sediments, briefly exposed with tidal movements as the water rose, could shrink and crack very quickly. Thus, cracks in mud don't disprove the flood. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. So our subject this week is the massive improbability of life arising from non-life. And, and, and beyond the probability problem for evolutionists, an additional massive problem is that if yes. all the chemicals required to make a cell were floating around together, they'd destroy each other, not more, more form problem. a cell. Yeah, yeah. big problems. Uh, we have to say, though, that it's almost pointless about talking about probabilities of a chain of amino acids forming because life is so much more than just a bunch of chemicals. Yeah. Life is full of high technology machinery, codes and programs that have mind-boggling data compression, et cetera, et cetera, all of which are not an inherent property of the chemicals. Absolutely. CMI did this animation to, to show uh, just how uh, amazing the, the workings of life are at the smallest level, so, so let's have a look. Yeah. This animation demonstrates how the digital information encoded within DNA is used to direct protein synthesis. This is a DNA double helix containing the digital code which directs the cell in all aspects of operation. And here we see a protein complex called an RNA polymerase traveling down the DNA strand. As it moves down the strand, it carefully unwinds the DNA, preparing it for transcription. Inside the polymerase, we see a single stranded copy of the original instructions being assembled as individual bases are positioned and added to the growing strand. A stop code marks the end of the protein specification, at which point this copy, known as a messenger RNA transcript, 
exits the polymerase and heads towards a two-part chemical manufacturing machine called the ribosome. While the messenger RNA moves towards the ribosome, transfer RNA molecules attach to specific amino acids in preparation for assembly. As the messenger RNA transcript passes through the ribosome, the process of translation begins. Using the instructions encoded on the messenger RNA as a template, the transfer RNA molecules align specific sequences of bases to corresponding amino acids, creating a protein chain. As this chain exits the ribosome, it is met by chaperones which prevent premature folding, while escorting the protein to a barrel-shaped machine called a chaperonin. This machine helps fold the protein into the precise shape required to perform its function. Although it is unclear how the chaperonin achieves this, we do know that accurate folding is essential in order for the protein to accomplish its intended function. Once the protein is complete, it is released into the cytoplasm to do its job. Isn't that incredible? Just makes your jaw drop. And, and, and you think, God designed all of these amazing biological machines and information storage and transfer systems, and we're only now beginning to understand a little bit about them. It's just amazing. <laughs> it's true. No observation has ever shown information-bearing structures like DNA arising spontaneously. Right. The obvious inference from science as well as the obvious implications of scripture is that the original creation of living things involved the very opposite of chance. It involved right. external intelligence applied to matter by an intelligent designer, the creator God. Yeah, That's what the, the science Bible. and math shows. That's right. for, for, for more of this kind of information, we highly recommend the book Evolution's Achilles Heels. It has a chapter on the origin of life as well as chapters on natural selection, uh, genetics and DNA and the, ge the geologic record, radiometric dating, cosmology, and, and many more. It's, it's our evolution master <laughs> blaster. That's, that's the way I refer to it anyway. That's right. It covers so many areas and it just, it's a fantastic book. Yeah, it really is. It's authored by nine PhD scientists and edited by a tenth. And then since right. the book was uh, published only um, a couple of years ago, um, it, it's just become a, like a bestseller uh, for yeah. people looking yeah. for information just on the creation it up. evolution it's crazy. debate. Yeah. Um, so uh, actually, we're, we're going to make it easy for you to, uh, as a viewer of Creation Magazine Live, to get a copy of your own. Um, you can go to our website and use the, uh, go through the, 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 the website store there. And when you're checking out, you can use this code CML. E A H Evolution's Achilles Heels, and you're going to get 30% off uh, the the book when yeah. you uh, when you purchase it there. Yeah, it's an amazing resource that shows how evolution fails in many areas of science. It'll equip you with powerful evidence that God's word is true, and build your faith in the accuracy of the Bible. Genesis verse by verse is a Bible study tool available on CMI's website, designed to help pastors, students, and laymen alike. Study the book of Genesis like never before, and it's completely free. Simply look up any verse in Genesis 1-11, to or just scroll down the page. The center column provides links to articles that answer common questions pertaining to that verse, and the topics that naturally arise from them. Visit creation.com to use it today. All right, yeah, welcome back. We're talking about in the news, things that are happening in the news. This is a bit of a curious one, because this... This, uh, this uh, area where these fossils that we're going to be talking about uh, were found was big news many years ago. But right. nevertheless, it's yep. in the news again. So here we go. Uh, this is an article written by, it's on, from creation.com. So it's one of our articles here uh, just up recently. If Noah's flood really happened, then why don't we see any evidence for it, a skeptic might ask. In today's era of mass media disinformation, he, he writes here, interesting, uh, this type of question is hurled at Bible believers daily. The question quite simply is this, evidence for Noah's flood is everywhere. Or the answer is, is evidence for Noah's flood is everywhere, but it's not reported as such by mainstream secular sources. A recent Associated Press article posted on the Guardian website uh, provides us with yet another perfect example of how evidence can be hidden in plain sight when presented 
in a completely dishonest way. Right. And it continues, the Liscomb bone bed in the Prince Creek Formation in northern Alaska, um, the Liscomb bone bed is in the Prince Creek Formation in northern Alaska, a report by a team of scientists who've been excavating in this area detailed what they claim is a new type of hadrosaur. So it's a duck-billed dinosaur, okay. uh, some bones that they found. The Associated Press immediately published an online article about the paper, but curiously, a very important detail was omitted. The bones aren't fossilized. Wow. So these are dinosaurs which have to be at least 65 million years old, and yet they're not, they're not they're, stone. They're, they're not just bones. And they didn't mention that. And they didn't so mention here's that. Here's a dinosaur. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Uh, some other excerpts from the article here. Um, here. Actually, here's an excerpt from the original paper. The hadrosaurid remains are almost entirely disarticulated, show little evidence of weathering, predation or trampling and are typically uncrushed and unpermineralized. Unfossilized. That's unfossilized. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they're claimed it to be fossils, but that's not mentioned. Yeah, it's meant and the, ori the original <clears throat> scientific paper mentions it, right. but the report in The Guardian, the popular level press, omitted that detail. That's a that's a huge detail. That's right. They're dinosaur bones, and they're not even fossilized. That's incredible. <laughs> Just amazing. Later on in the uh, article, um, it, it says, though the evolutionary community is powerless to explain how dinosaur bones could remain unfossilized over vast eons of time, this evidence poses no problem for the biblical creationist. Right. Indeed, a clue is given in the original paper. The bone bed is posited to reflect a mass mortality event associated with overbank flood deposits, and which uh, could have resulted from rapid snow melt from the then rising Brooks Range to the south. Hmm. Or, or could have resulted from a different type of flooding. <laughs> can, can, you, can you see how a lot of, if, if you strip away the evolutionary wrapping that these sorts of things are always delivered to us in, yeah. can, you, can you see how without a whole lot of modification they fit beautifully with the Bible? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're talking here about flooding and the way you just described and it. Fresh bones are and, not and fossilized. Fresh, fresh bones, right. So they're not millions of years old. They must have been rapidly buried in a watery flood-like environment recently. Yep. Uh, the Bible is it just... Amazing. The, the, the other parts of the article say this. So what we have is this. Fresh dinosaur bones have been found, which appear to have been laid down as par in part of a flood, which killed a mass of creatures simultaneously. This fits absolutely perfectly with what we would expect to find in the Bible, if the Bible's history were true. Right. Noah's flood explains the evidence. I mean, it, you can look at article after article like this and, uh, and get the same conclusion. Exactly. That's what we do at CMI. We, we give you the creationist understanding of some of these things. Next week, we're going to talk about epigenetics, what it is, and how does it support creation. See you next week.